deep in the forests of North America, a creature is said to exist. A creature that people are encountering. With far too many reports to ignore, there are elements of truth behind these accounts that mankind can no longer ignore. Breaking news out of Texas, Bigfoot is real. Could a breeding population of large, upright, hairy hominids really exist in North America? Or is there something more paranormal at work here, deep in the woods? If just one footprint, one wood knock, or one howl is real, the man's understanding of primate evolution would be changed forever. Join the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective as they delve further into the mysteries of Bigfoot and other paranormal phenomena through the eyes of witnesses, investigators, critics, and skeptics. Join us as we look to discover what lurks from behind tall trees? Here we that, go. That actually reminds me. I'm supposed there to think we go. A little, uh, I'm supposed to think up a little slogan. For any For... Oh yeah. Yeah, like you know how CRC? It's you know we have where we do where strange things happen. Brendan wants to come up with something like that for from behind tall trees, a little tagline, and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> totally drop the ball with that in the. Virginia biography I'm supposed to get you. Yes. <laughs> so I'm just realizing this now. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> we got we got Jason and Tommy. Hey guys, what's going on? How you been? Excellent. Excellent. How have you guys been? Hey, we're doing good, man. We got doing there's a, I found there was there was a class A sighting up by uh, by me two two or three days ago. So I think this weekend I'm gonna drive around the area and see uh see what I can find. But you know, being in oh, New yeah. Jersey. Yeah. Did they did they come to you? Who's that? The uh, no, yeah, I they, actually saw it in another group. I posted in another group, and I was like, "Wait a second, that's like a half an hour for me." So <laughs> uh, nice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so do my, own, my own investigation. I'm hoping Mike maybe Mike come up comes up, but uh, yeah. But other than that, uh, what about you guys? Out. He was still wanting to get out by you by you guys though. You, you were at the tire shop, right, Charlie? Yes, I was. I visited. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. Yeah, we kind of awesome. Took, awesome. <laughs> took him kind of on a little bit of a tour of uh, the area behind there, and uh, that that was that was pretty cool afternoon. I think you were there about what two or three hours. Two or three hours, yeah, it was two or three hours, and then I made my way out to uh, the OBC, I believe. No, I, mean, I was making my way out to uh, the Michigan uh, conference, so it's kind of like a nice little, uh, you know, stretch my legs, get to you know meet you guys, and then check out the area. Yeah, we went by, uh, we went by the place, the spot where. Uh, I think Tommy had, or there was a Wolfman sighting. And yeah, then we, were, yeah. we stopped by the mound, which was cool. We, hopefully we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then you also brought me by uh, the uh, that stream with all the uh, the oil that you guys were posting about. That That's kind of yeah, interesting. Oil. Yeah. Yeah. Oil yeah. 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 Th that's one of the things uh, about where we're at is just a couple of miles for me um, was drilled the, uh, the, the, the first oil well in the world. Uh, Colonel Drake's well was drilled just a, a few miles from here. And um, there's a really nice state park that surrounds that, that we've spent a lot of time in, including uh, if you ever see our stuff about Miller Farm, um, that that's a part of that same state park. Um, but the, they knew the oil was here because it, it just, it, it flows on the, on top of the water. And in, in a lot of the the areas around here where you have uh, backwaters and eddies, uh, you can see it, it, it collects as like a rainbow and orange scum. Um, and they knew what they were looking for. They knew it wasn't very far down. I think that first oil well was only like 80 feet down or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so an oil creek was named Oil Creek long before that that oil well was drilled um, because of the, the oil that, that flows on it. Um, and there's historical documents here of uh, oil collection pits by the thousands um, that were, that were uh, still, there were remnants of them here still uh, between the turns of, uh, from the 19th to the 20th centuries. 
Um, and I think at the time they counted two or 3,000 were still visible. Um, and these were pits that were, it's, it's, it's incredible the, uh, the industry involved because they somebody dug at an angle away from the crypt. They created these backwater channels and they put these wood-lined oil pits in there. Um, some are square and some are more like an octagon. And the wood that was lining it was uh, was halved. So you got you would take a, a, a small log and have it and you have two and you have a smooth side and a round side. And those that wood is so saturated with uh, with oil, which is a great preservative that they don't rot. But at the same time, you can't really carbon date them either. You could only make fine estimates and guesses as to how yeah. long they've been there. And right there you see that that orange scum is collecting and that's the remnants of a pit right there um and there's the very smooth uh wood there um that somebody split and lined these and then they were we theorize at least that they were there for collecting oil because you see what it does it does collect the oil um and then there's there's an illustration of of it and you know, they, they created these bat channels. So not only did you have to dig it out, but then you had to line it and cut it with these. And the historical documents locally kind of haphazardly attributed to the, uh, to the local Indians, the Seneca. But the Seneca don't have any story at all about utilizing or building them. And some Seneca say that they were here when they got here, that they predated um as as they moved, I, I think from the north and from the east, um, and so they were already here. Um, so who built them? If they did, um, and it, it's it's you know, and is that what they were after? Is oil? Did we? You know, was was that the first ever oil boom? And we don't really know anything about it. Uh, and what were they doing with it? The popular thing among historians were that the Indians had cultivated them for for moisturizing their hair. And that's a heck of a lot of industry for a very, you know, for for hair conditioner. You know, it doesn't really ring true. Um, so who who was doing it and why? Um, and there are lots of stories among the Seneca about giants being here before. Um, they, there used to be a, a, a race called the Allegheny, which may well be what the Allegheny is named after. Um, and were they who created, who did these? Um, and the same with burial mounds. We have a lot of burial mounds. You know, the pits that we were at earlier this week were, I would say, 500 yards away from that Indian mound that, that or that burial mound that, that you were at, Chuck. You yeah. Know? So you've got all of those things correlating. And, and again, the Seneca elsewhere, the, you know, that those aren't theirs, I don't believe. And I don't think they think they're theirs. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, these, these are just some of the mysteries that are in Cryptovania. I mean, this place is, it's off the hook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, right there, within a, a few, within a thousand yards of each other, you've got ancient oil pits. You have burial mounds, and then just another few thousand feet uh, further on, you have um, that uh, that dogman sighting that you referred to um, earlier. Um, yeah. And, and so you know, just in that little spot there, we've got these these, you know, what's going? What what happened here? And and so. That that's a that's kind of a, a part of this this new mission that we have here is we've got this we've got this fantastic array of stories just waiting to be discovered and waiting to be told and uh, we want to invite all our friends we want to invite you guys Absolutely. come help us tell this story and let's see the stories in your guys's backyard too. Absolutely, you can you can come out to New Jersey if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and. You know, and, and that's kind of one of the fun things about how how we go about and, and we're really 
we're looking for the, for the that that camaraderie of the groups and coming from elsewhere and coming here and putting their own touch on this cryptovania story um that we have uh we have coined uh, decoding cryptovania um in honor of a, a film that edward monge made about our area on one of his visits here yeah. um and uh you know so we've we've decided we are uh dedicating this coming spring and summer to uh decoding cryptovania and uh we're kind of doing a call of arms to all our friends to come out and join us and uh Let's start putting these. Uh, let's put start telling these stories. Absolutely. And that includes you guys. Well, well, we're in. We're in, Tommy J. Thank you very much for the for the invite. Well, uh, we got to coordinate, and we'll we'll definitely uh, figure out a, a weekend yep. or some some time to get out there. Yeah. Uh, right, right, Mike. You, you ready yeah. to go out there, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I remember last uh, last year, two thousand twenty one, we meant to uh, we meant to make our way back out there, but we never, mm -hmm. we never did. So you know, we're definitely due. And not even a bad drive. It's only like five hours and change for us, five, six hours, depending. Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll, we'll put you up. Um, that's, that's one of the things that we, we like to, to offer with what, and we've always done in the past is somebody comes and uh, we'll put you up for the weekend uh, at one of our hotels. And in the past it had been with the emphasis of, well, we're going to do an interview in our, in our studio mm -hmm. and we're going to get to know this, these researchers and, introduce them to our our cryptovania audience um and now that we've done those introductions for the last three almost four years now we want to take those relationships and we want to decode cryptovania and we want to put that on film as much as we can awesome yeah, so i want to circle back to, i want to circle back to the oil pits yes um, sir yeah you know you guys you guys had mentioned that they'd been Used by used by the Sen the Senecas, but then there's a lot of people from the Seneca tribe who claim that they they were there before them, that they predated mm -hmm. them. Weren't some of the other? I read some of the other uses that they might have used them for were um, war paint. I think yeah, like uh, war paint. I even medi even medicinal purposes, which I find a little uh, which I find a little peculiar. Have you guys ever have you ever heard the theory about how the it's kind of out there, but the ancient Minoans, they were a um, society, they were a really ancient civilization out in uh, East Europe on the island of Crete, I think. There's a theory out there that they made their way to North America and they excavated a lot of the uh, copper, copper and other precious metal deposits in like the northern U.S., PA, I guess the oil too, and they brought, brought that back to Crete to jumpstart the um, Bronze Age, there. You've uh, um, you've been listening to uh, Fritz Zimmerman. <laughs> I, I, forgot, I forgot where I, I forgot where I got that from, but I just thought that was an interesting. Yeah, I th I think it's very true. I mean, it could have been true. Mm -hmm. and, One and thing it, that you, you can't believe anything that the history books say. It, it could have been anything. Um, it could have been people traveling over the ocean and going here and going there with it. But one thing is for sure, the uh, the copper artifacts, they're, they're definitely, they're here. Or at least they were until the Smithsonian snagged them. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah just like uh, the um, not very far from here is uh, West Hickory, which was the site of um, the largest reported in America, the largest reported uh excavation that came up with a, a giant and it's it was reported at uh, 13 foot tall and it also had a uh bronze or copper helmet as well as a large large sword and there's there's newspaper articles from the local papers and even from pittsburgh papers talking about the artifacts being those, I think. visible and right. shared for like a day and then spirited off and we never hear anything about it um the mound that was is here in hidetown uh the the property owners was telling us that you know back in the 50s you know it was well known when he was a kid that the smithsonian had been there in the 50s and whatever they took they never gave any accounting of you know there's no there's nothing anywhere that says what they found in there. They just know that the Smithsonian was there. Um, and, you know, 
where does all this stuff get spirited to? But you know, you you, you point out the, the the possibility of a ancient race here maybe having a a, a mineral boom. You know, oil fits right into that as a possibility. Um, and and it does seem like that there was trade and travel being done here on you know in ancient times that kind of defies the narrative of you know everybody being you know just near fresh out of caves honestly well we know we know that um europeans made it to north america prior to columbus um you know the, the vikings did it i think i forget the details but i think there was a story of how they found a um Either somewhere in North Canada or somewhere on the coast, somewhere on the coast of the eastern U.S., they found like an old sword that was traced back to uh, ancient Rome or something like that. I, I forget, I forget the context of the story, but some something like that. So there were instances, uh, you know, like pre-Columbian, where these pe you know people mm -hmm. from Europe were able to were able to make their their way here. Just. The Minoan, you know, the story about the ancient Minoans, it's really fascinating. Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I just don't. I mean, this is just my this is just my opinion based on what little I know. I just don't know if they would travel as far inland as like PA or Michigan for the sole purpose of collecting metals and things like that. If that makes mm -hmm. any sense. It, it's really hard to say. Or was what was the purpose? Or was that just a um. Could that have just been a, a side purpose or, you know, you know, I mean, like how many times in history have uh, have we done things just to spread the word of yeah. this or that? And, uh, you know, it's hard to say what the motivations would be. Um, and and it, it could be like putting together all of these things into like a like a, a, a treasure hunt type thing. Um, you know, the, the, the possibilities are, are really endless. Um, I do know that over in Ohio, there was talk that um, brass lamps were found in those those mounds over in Ohio. And the brass lamps, they yeah. seem to be like thousand year old, you know, again, predating yeah. the, the whole Columbus thing. And, and who had those and why? Um, yeah, and, and what they burn in them? I mean, it had to be the oil. It was. Mm -hmm. It was. It yeah. had to be. That's that's you know that's that's the that's where I lean is that those those lamps were fueled by oil gathered right here in Cryptovania, right here in uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania, Northwest Pennsylvania, on um, the site of the first uh, first the world's first oil well that or first drilled oil well, um, and you know that that's you know was this spot right here at one point you know for a, a society of people a, 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 like a, a a global spot that was happening you know that's kind of what we feel and that's the thing too like there's so little we know about pre-columbian pre -Columbian societies and civilizations and mm -hmm. For all we know, for all we know, predating the uh, Senecas and all those other tribes, who knows how many civilizations or societies have risen or fallen just just here in North America alone that we're probably never going to know about. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they. I, I think there was. I remember reading something about how humans were. There are a lot more. There are like tens of millions apparently that lived here in the Americas, and they were here a lot longer than scientists originally thought. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, you can be sure of one thing, everything you've been told is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Nothing would surprise me nowadays. No. <laughs> no. If, if there's ever been a time that that, that, that that seems true, I mean, like, you know, in today's times, Nothing's off the table, and nothing with surprise is surprising. And so much that we we see is 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 false. Yeah. And you know, even there's, there's nothing. Go ahead. There's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, was this you know a, a bustling trade center for giants collecting oil to be used in lamps? 
you know, across the North American continent? Maybe. We'd like to find out and we'd like to and it's and it's really fun going and figuring it out and doing it. Um and you know, so even if we get proven wrong or it's it's still the it's still that quest that's that that it's really a, it's really fun. And that's what we shoot for with our that was our, our whole goal with Cryptovania is we wanted to have some fun. Yeah, for sure. With a lot of these, with a lot of these stories, though, about giant skeletons and whatnot, um, mm -hmm. Brendan, I think we have, you know, like as I talk, I think we have um, pictures of like a couple of articles about these things we answered. Yeah, here's one of them. I think, yeah, Erie County, and I think there's a second one in uh, Pittsburgh, I think, or something like that. No. Okay, is that uh, McKee's Rocks or? Because there, there is um, there was a, a, a an excavation where they they found giants. Um, I think it was north of Pittsburgh. Um, if it's not McKee's Rocks, it's something kind of similar to that. And this article here, it's interesting. It mentions the part of giant. That one was found, I believe, in Western New York mm -hmm. around like the late nineteenth century. Apparently, that turned out. Apparently, the part of giant turned out to be a hoax. Um, is that from back then, or was it a was it a hoax perpetrated now, and given historic fake historical context, or was it a fake back then? So the story I read was it was perpetrated by this guy named George Hull. What he pretty much did was he carved out, he pretty much carved like a skeleton out of gypsum out of a gypsum block, mm -hmm. and he buried it on a farm near Cardiff, uh, near. Uh, Cardiff, New York. Okay. And um, apparently, yeah, so like, it seems like a lot of these stories about like giant skeletons being unearthed, like, yeah, like it seems to have originated, you know, like in your guy, your guys' neck of the woods, but the stories I read were a lot of them were either hope were either just like outright hoaxes, a lot of instances, you know, they were um, just instances of misidentification, mm -hmm. just, like mammoth bones for, you know, human bones, and, or just, you know, um, Native Native American bodies, which probably seemed, probably seemed bigger to, you know, uh, white Europeans back then, around that time, the 19th century, you know, the average European's height was about five and a half feet, Whereas the average the average Native American's height was over six feet, so just that distinction alone, looking at bones and things like that, especially have like you know if you have a have like a taller one, I guess could run up what their imagine imagination run wild. It is kind of mm -hmm. sketchy though how you have all these stories about these skeletons or remains they find you know conveniently disappear you know disappear or vanishing when mm -hmm. trend and things like that. Um, you guys are talking about the Smithsonian having something to do with it. Yes. Yes. Um, that's kind of uh, pre that's a very predominant um, uh, theme throughout a lot of these uh, these mounds uh, and and discoveries is the uh, the Smithsonian coming in um, and either not giving any word of what they have found or giving a very brief glimpse and then spearing it spearing it off. Um, and such as the one from West Hickory, I, I, I think that the, you know, the, that was publicly displayed for, I think, 24 hours. Um, you know, and like, like, why the secrecy? What are you hiding? Why the secrecy? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that kind of just like the, the Bigfoot phenomenon, um, I think for, for every, uh, every Rick Dyer out there, how many people are out there actually legitimately doing bigfoot research you know and not looking to hoax you know you do have some 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 hoaxers in bigfoot but we we all know that not everything is is hoaxed yeah. um and so you you kind of have to uh take that with a grain of salt and you also have to um you have to take into account kind of like when you have somebody who interprets a a novel from or a a book from one language to another you have to have the uh 
you have to look at the skill of the uh, the interpreter. Um, to, to give an example of that, uh, when this past uh, couple of weeks, we've really taken a deep dive into uh, a missing person case here called the, the, the Jackie Copeland uh, disappearance, which happened in 1950, and a, a two-and-a-half-year-old boy wandered away from a uh, a, a picnic, a, a uh, company picnic, uh, here in the oil fields and disappeared for for 20 to 24 hours um and when i first dove into it i came across a a, a reddit thread that seemed really good and it but it, it's its emphasis was david pilates had done a, a feature on jackie jackie boy's disappearance and this reddit thread was um, basically going after Pilates for um, cherry picking evidence and fabricating, including at one point, um, he describes it as, as being the where he was found was surrounded by impassable swamp. And the the debunker just tore Pilates apart for uh, for making this up and not and saying that he didn't back it up with any documentation. He just made it up. And I was like, well, that's an interesting factoid, but I kept it in the back of my mind. And then when I was doing my own research and I found the local newspaper's story of it, there right in the last paragraph is the uh, the guy that found Jackie Boy saying, yeah, I don't know how he got there. It was surrounded by impossible swamp. And I'm like, well, right there is exactly in the, the story from the newspaper at the site saying, that he was surrounded by an impossible swamp yet this a big part of this debunking was that pilates didn't back up with the documentation well right there it is and i'm not the best researcher but that was very early in my search that i was able to find that so you know if i were you know that first impression of that debunking was well maybe there wasn't much to this and then well yes it was but i almost got chased away by a debunking that really didn't live up to its uh, its expectations, so maybe that is also accounts for. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, guys, we got a, a quick question here here in the chat yeah. from our friend um, Amy Amy Boo. I just want to get to this question real quick. Yeah, we love quick. Amy Boo. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, I love so like, Amy. Amy. She'd like to know she was, here. Um, she was here. Oh, she was? Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah, because she lives out in uh, Western PA, East Ohio, that area. So she's right. Yeah, she's Ohio. Right. Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, have you guys ever had, yeah, like, what surprising animals, you know, not Bigfoot or nothing like that, have you guys come across in the woods? That's actually a pretty interesting question. So, I mean, what would, your, what would yours be? Well, I mean, coyotes, bobcats. Mountain lions. I mean, those are the normal type things that we we get reports of. Mm -hmm. um, have you actually seen the mountain lion, mountain you know, lion out there? Oh yeah, I have a picture of one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And we have a, a friend that, uh, that shot a video showing um, a, a pair of black lions kind of cavorting. Yes, yes. Wow. And it's a it's a very good it's a very good video. Unfortunately, he's shaken because he's just he's just amped. And he's like, well, of course I was amped. I'm looking at two black lions, you know. And but it, yeah. it, it's a really good it's a really good video uh, taken by Tyke Bell. Um, he was out, I think yeah. he was out archery hunting, and you know, and he's yeah, he he was. and he's kind of reaching around the uh, the the uh, the tree and um and and sna snaps his video you know and but there you see it they're they're running around and it's not very blobby um and uh it's it's it's, it's pretty good um and i i've myself have I, i've seen lion in, in the woods a couple times but not here in pennsylvania um i've seen lion um out west and it's a really weird feeling when you see them because it's both times it was like he wasn't there, then he was there, and then he wasn't there. And 
I don't vividly remember the the entrance or the exit of either of those encounters. It was just all of a sudden there was a lion there, and then there was not a lion there. And the one was uh, probably, I seen him for like five seconds, and the other one probably 10 to 20 seconds. Um, and then they were gone. And so it, I think about that a lot when we hear witness tales and they talk about, you know, Bigfoot or a dog man and it's there and then it's gone and they just, you just, it, it kind of defies your, your uh, it defies how you, how you look at things or what your mind is prepared for. Um, and, and so for me, those two lion encounters are my like most supernatural thing, um, especially from a, a wildlife standpoint. And uh, that would be mine. And it does, it, it is a weird spiritual feeling when you, when you see a lion. Oh, I'm sure. And yeah. it's, funny, it's funny how you mentioned the, the black lions too. Um, I've been I've been doing this stuff like consistently for probably about two ish years now since I've been with the CARC. Before that, I kind of did it like on and off and intermittently for about uh, you know five to six years. But you know, you I'm sure you guys could attest to you come across a lot of different characters and the characters in this field. You know, doing the stuff. Mm -hmm. You hear all sorts of different stories about things people have seen. I feel like besides Bigfoot and Sasquatch, the one thing I hear the most about people seeing are these black panthers or mountain lions, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would call them black jaguars, actually. That's what yeah, I would call them. Because it, it's that mountain lions aren't, there's not a black variant of a, of, you know, I guess I call them black lions, but in all reality, you are looking at a, a jaguar. You know, and that that's kind the, of the, weird. The interesting thing about the black jaguar is that they're 100 pounds heavier than a mountain lion. Mm -hmm. I thought jaguars were smaller than pumas. Okay. What's that? I thought jaguars were yeah. smaller than pumas. I think they're actually bigger. Yeah. Oh, okay. huh. yep. But but I don't know that positively. Um, I'm but pretty there's sure. not there's not a black lion you know there's so when you see a black cat that's that's a whole different species you know that's that's a kind of a that one's kind of cool and we were really pumped when we got that one into to cryptovania and we have taiki bell and you, oh. you see that one yeah and, uh, yeah we had to we had to do some work to get that one too oh man i'll tell you what that boy, he did not want to hear somebody that was a cryptid investigator trying to get a hold of him and stuff like that. Oh, man, it was cool. <laughs> yeah. I've probably heard at least from uh, probably 10 or 10 to 12 separate people accounts, whether it's firsthand or secondhand, of people seeing black, mm -hmm. big black cats out in the wild. And it's not just isolated to a particular region. I've heard stories yeah. coming out of New York, New England, uh, West Virginia. Um, down, oh, really? south, down south, I, I, I hear a lot. Even at, even out, um, you know, like the Midwest, Nebraska, Kansas. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still hear stories about them even out west. There's a good population of them in Ireland, actually. Um, and that's one of the reasons our, our buddies, uh, Chris Dawson and Jim Bradley, um, when they go when they go out bigfooting in Ireland, those two. Most of the time, they're at least one of them's armed to the teeth, and it's not because of Bigfoot. It, a lot of times, it's because of uh, black lions, black cats. Yep. Um, and yep. we were talking to them about it, and they said that they feel that that, that population was um, from. They used to be pets, and then there were regulations put in, put forth, or taxes from the government, and rather than pay them or comply, people just ended up letting oh, those. Yeah. Yeah, and yep. and there are lots of uh, black cat reports there in um in uh, in Ireland. Um, and uh, when I looked into that on the research, I was really surprised at how prevalent that is. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're really into to North American cats, um, you can't leave uh, Alexander Petikoff off of your uh, your viewing list. Um, he, he's a very good movie. Uh, um, I think it's Lions of the East. And uh, yep. he's he's uh, he's done a very good job with that. Um, I think 
yeah, he's he's his his stuff is really good, and you can't take a dive into uh into lions on this continent without talking to or looking at Alexander's work. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we had George, George Workman, Workman too. We yeah. had a, Ken yeah. we had Ken Gerhardt on a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, we had Ken Ger Gerhardt on, and one of the, we we actually we actually covered this topic for a little bit. Uh -huh. um, he he helped produce or consult for a documentary about big cats in big cats in the UK. Uh, he wasn't like he wasn't in it, but you know he helped like he helped uh, consult for it. So that, that was one of the things we talked about. Yeah, uh, it was it was pretty it was a pretty interesting interesting watch. It was only about forty minutes or so. It's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really interesting trail camera video. Charlie, do, do you you got a chance to watch it, right? Yeah, I was watching. Yeah, I watched a little bit of it, but uh, I think that's that's. What they're talking about right the uh, jim bradley isn't that the, the same guys or no? uh, that would be Maybe. jim bradley would be in ireland or at least the gym that i was referencing yeah this is the, yeah, this is more this is more you i don't think it was specifically up in, uh i don't think it was specifically up in ireland but um mm -hmm. that would be where jim is yeah i want to circle i want to circle back though i know we i know we got kind of sidetracked but yeah i want to circle back to the um Jack, uh, you know, the uh, Jack Copeland disappearance. Yes. It's interesting how you bring up where he was found. He was found in a swampy area, inaccessible, you, you know, like really mm -hmm. difficult to get to. It reminds me of a couple of things. If I, you know, I bring this, I bring this up all the time when I get the opportunity to. It re do you guys remember back in 2018, 2019, there was that three-year-old boy who got lost in the North Carolina wilderness? Yes. Yep. Yeah, they found him like three days later, and he said he hung out with a bear for three days. Yep. What's interesting yep. about that is how they found him. They found this kid in a swampy area. There's articles that literally say rescue workers were up to their um, waists in water, traveling through, and I think they found him on like a little, little like island mound that was just like jutting up, jutting up from the water, almost like he was placed there or something like that. So keep yep. that in mind. I also have read, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of reading one of Dave Prolides' Missing 411 books. Mm -hmm. And there's, I think, at least two. There might have been a third instance of stories. I think one was in Michigan. I think one was down south. But stories of kids who, same thing, kids around that age range who went missing. And in both of these stories... I have it. I have. I have it. Um, I have it. Mark in the book too. In both of in both of these stories, the kids were you know these kids were discovered same circumstances in a swampy area. Some of them on mounds, jutting from the water, surrounded by water. The water was like waist deep for you know these rescue workers to trek through. So just seeing that overlap in these three or four separate instances over the years. You know, cope with this, you know, that kid in North Carolina, his testimony, what Jack Copeland saw and everything like that. I just, you know, I just, I think it's just worth, it doesn't get the attention that, you know, like that overlap, that, that correlation, I just feel doesn't get the attention it deserves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we, we agree. And this, and when you look into the Jackie Copeland too, uh, it told me didn't, isn't, there, he has some kind of uh, animal encounter involved with his, too, doesn't he? Yeah, he said that he was led through the woods by, like, a like a giant, and there was a bunch of animals out there making noise, like, at night and stuff like that. I mean, really hard to prove, but, I mean, still, it, it was there. It's in the reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think it said, like, he was, he followed, like, some kind of giant being and the, that being and a giant tree kept him safe from uh, like something like the awful darkness and, 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 uh, and like wild animals, like yelling and stuff. And, and, yeah. and then when they found him, he was, they found him the next morning. Well, in an area yeah. they had, they had searched that area thoroughly before the, the night before. And, you know, just how many people were there? Trust 300, there was, 300 yeah. searchers. Yes. Yeah. And there, there, and there was blood bloodhounds, bloodhounds and airplanes and 300 mm -hmm. people. And, and, you know, yeah. this area, this area that he's talking of, 
it's right down the road from Trost House. It's, yes. it's right there. It's, it's yeah. like seven miles from here, man. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got to investigate this stuff in Cryptovania. And and like like the, yeah, they mentioned, he was he was at a uh, they found him at a repressuring plant, uh, you know, for the, the local oil fields because his dad worked in the oil fields and and that was a, a company picnic and. I used to do those jobs. I used to work these same oil fields that, that Jackie's dad worked and, and, you know, maybe even some of those same leases and stuff ha have I been on and done work on. And, and so there's, there's that, th this is really cool. This is really cool. And, and, it, and it does. Um, and Pilates mentions it in his, one of his, I think the book on, on Eastern U S and uh yeah that's so one that's where i got those those accounts from i think yeah yeah and and in there you know there again there's that that common thread of something led him and then protected him you know maybe and and so we're still trying to, to dig deeper into that and find yeah find these things maybe even find find jackie um and uh yeah, and an expert like I think the nation's leading bear expert from the University of Montana weighed in on what this kid claimed, and um, she even said, "Yeah, even paternal instincts or not, bears don't do shit like that." Yeah, <laughs> we don't care yeah. of the bear. So a lot of people, a lot of people are dismissing it as, "All right, the kid, you know, maybe the kid was just uh, delusional, delusional, and the man imagined it or whatever." But when you look at just you know, like when you bring up all those previous those previous cases and just the similarities, mm -hmm. you know, again, it just, I just would, I, I just wish like the, when you have people who go out there trying to justify the possibility that something like a Bigfoot could exist, I wish they, I like, I feel like examples like that are really, really strong to use then, um, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the generic arguments that people make. Yeah. What, what kept those kids safe? And why couldn't they be found? You know, yeah, that's you know, even if you even if you dismiss the claim as delusional, it still doesn't explain why they weren't found. You know, um, like this case with Jackie Copeland. You know, the newspapers say it wasn't. It's not a conjecture that there were three hundred. It's you know, it's, there were three hundred people scouring the these oil fields. Are in the and these these woods and they had a they commandeered an airplane um and they had a, a a team of dogs the uh the, the Venango County Sheriff was here with a uh, with with bloodhounds and the kid was found three quarters of a mile from where he disappeared from and you know that's how did he get a that three quarters of a mile is an awfully awfully tough traverse and the guy that found him Bevier he said that. The only way that kid could have gotten there was to have been out on the road itself, because the road is kind of like a peninsula out to this repressuring plant. And you know, how did he get there? And if he was out on the road, why didn't we see him? And you know, you, you can't just there again, those things. And there again, this is some of the mysteries that are in Cryptovania. There's yeah. so much stuff here, mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, this is our backyard. <laughs> yeah, you guys, I'm jealous. You know, and again, there's that oil theme right there too. You know, generation after generation, here's the the, the oil theme. You know, it was a uh, oil field company picnic um, that they were at, um, and, and you know, it, it's 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 crazy. You know, today's modern times. You know, oil is you know so so prominent in our in our news and stuff. Um, it's 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 kind of a it's an odd thread that that runs all the way through these these cryptovania um occurrences here and oh, that's that, without I didn't that's without that. even talking about the thunderbird <laughs> yeah um, yeah that's right you guys got thunderbirds out there too yeah. yes yeah yeah this is a, this is a this is a wild spot this is uh you know we used to jokingly say that we were the center of the universe. Now, you know, that, you know, that we want to, we at least want to kind of put that out there. We're the center of the universe, at least we're, for our universe. <laughs> you guys also got the, uh, the Nessie and uh, Kinzu, right? You, have a, in the, uh, you betcha. Star? Yeah. They, yep. they can, and again, giants figures into that whole area for the, when they were building the Kinzu dam, 
there's there's stories of um them opening up these these giant caverns that were like um state rooms with 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 uh with large ancient furniture that was just like huge um and there's even talk of that there was a uh, there was even a gun battle with uh with uh, the uh, the army and uh something that they they opened up here um and then you throw in the um the displacement of the indian village to build the dam and the the uh the odd juju that could be uh attributed from that um johnny cash actually uh talks about that and um you know that it, it's that that kinju area it, it's that that's that's some crazy stuff up there and and you also have um you have the the kinzu bessi or kinzu nessi um the uh the local boy scout troop when they go to the jam boy scout jamboree their patch is uh is kinzu nessi it's always a, a variation of it because uh it was a uh one of the reported sightings was from a, a group of uh boy scouts that was out camping and they had a an encounter with a uh a Nessie just off of just off the um the shoreline um and yeah, then, but then when you lower the, when you lower the uh the the reservoir and you get you create these areas that there's like videos uh that come out of the uh, strange kinju folk of of bigfoot trackways that go thousands of yards they they cross through the the, the red bridge mud and they're they're fantastic they're fantastic and they're 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 documented and measured and they're deep and they're very far apart and they go for thousands of yards. They cross the, they cross and go up into the woods. Um, it's just, just crazy. Just crazy. Yeah. Especially on, especially on the New York side of that reservoir. Cause when we were there, the reservoir was like lower, was like lowered. Mm -hmm. It got drained or something like that. So we actually, uh, me, me, Sean, and Derek, we actually walked the shoreline for shoreline for a couple of miles, and I saw probably the clearest black bear footprints I've ever I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, I probably saw at least 11, 12, identified mm -hmm. like at least 11, 12 different species of uh you know like just based on footprints but um especially in like the narrow especially in like the, you know the areas up there on the new york side where it gets really narrow when the water's low mm -hmm. so it could definitely conceive of you know something on two feet could conceivably cross you know from one, one area to another with that with very little mm -hmm. very little effort like yeah yeah and those mud flats there's they're so expansive and uh you know and they they do that and then they then the, the water rises back up and those those tracks are gone until the next time yeah yeah Re really cool stuff there in kinzu kinzu is is it, it's it's got a lot of uh it's got a lot of its own juju we have a um we have a a, a good uh, video available to us from the strange kinzu folk showing what looks like a kinzu nessie uh birth you know birthing on top of the water um, and you can actually see like a, a, a fin come up and kind of curl. And uh, I don't know, you can maybe dismiss it as a giant sturgeon or a few of them, you know, surfacing, maybe, you know, <laughs> you know there. But and again, I, like I, I posted a video today in the group. It was a, uh, a 10 foot long sturgeon in uh, British yeah. Columbia. And. That thing looked like a. That thing looked like it was unreal. It looked like it was a cryptid itself. That huge sturgeon, you know. Oh, they could get up to like twenty feet. Twenty feet, I think, out there. <laughs> Is that a cryptid? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm sure you guys heard of the Lake Iliamna, Iliamna monster, out in Alaska. I'm not sure that I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, like Lake Iliamna or whatever. Um, the show River Monsters. Have you ever seen that show before, Jeremy yeah. Wade? Yes. Yes. So he actually he actually went there and investigated it, and he th he thinks that the monster could actually be a white sturgeon. Mm. Oh, wow. you yeah. know, and if you have an like let's say an ancient great granddaddy sturgeon, how big can it get? You know, mm. and and if you find like a let's say you found a find a, that there's a thirty foot sturgeon, that's pretty. That would be pretty freaking impressive. You know. <laughs> That'd be a world. That'd be a record, I think. You know, and, and 
it, it's a possibility. And I would consider that cryptid in a way, you know, it's a it, giant and huge. Um, it, you know, but that's, that's one of the things that like, if you were looking to as a possibility of what else that, that Nessie video is, you could maybe make an argument there though. It would be hard to see another video replicating that actual kind of thing. You know, with Sturgeon doing that. Yeah, it's a. Go that's ahead. kind of one of the things that that I look at too. When when you when you're talking about like video evidence and stuff like that, and examining it, is replicate. It, can you replicate it? Like, like the like uh, um, like with Patty back in '67, who had the skill to replicate that kind of hoax if it was a hoax? Um who was can you replicate you know video showing um if you dismiss that oh that's just sturgeon well cool you should be able to come up with video of sturgeon doing that exact same thing and looking that exact same way um and i think that that's, that's one of the things that if you're debunking or arguing against the existence of something i think you should have the burden of proof there and you should replicate your clamps, um, and be able to at least point to a replication. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I look for in like, how could, if, if, if I'm dismissing something, how could it be the other thing? How do, how do you do that? You know, what are the nuts and bolts of like, say faking Patty? What are the nuts and bolts of doing that and creating that kind of, uh, that kind of imagery in 67? Um, I counter that you couldn't, um, though you can't say it would be impossible, you know. I mean, no one's even been able to, able to replicate the suit, to my knowledge. But um, getting back to what you're saying about trying to replicate, you're trying to replicate or reenact that mm -hmm. Kinzua photo, you would probably you would definitely have to go to that extra mile if you really truly wanted to get some context on at least how big whatever the subject was. But mm -hmm. for something like that, I feel you would have to go as far as find the exact spot, take like a boat out there or something like that, keep the length of the boat in mind. When you figure out where exactly, when you figure out where exactly um, the video is. Yeah, the video is. And okay. you know, the video is, you get the boat there. You know, I guess you compare the boat's length to whatever, whatever the subject, whatever the subject is. But, you know, let's be real. Who's going go, you know, I mean, us, yeah, definitely. But like any given person, who's really going to go through all that effort just to prove something that? Mm -hmm. And you know, what what year was that video took, Trust? Uh, for the Strange Kinju, I think that that was actually in the late 80s or early 90s. Because I think it's like yeah. a, what, like a, yeah. a the, the handheld, yeah. like little reel-to-reel -reel tapes, you know, and it's, it's grainy as heck. And, you know, when he first goes to it, you know, and he's kind of excited, but there it is. And he's able to zoom in on it. And, you know, it, it's an, it's, it's an awfully special video, I think. Yeah. And we're, we're familiar with that area. And when I look at how, how big that is oh, you man, know, with man. my own reference, it, it, it seems rather huge, honestly, honestly. <laughs> um, and, and it's an area that, is actually pretty easily visible from that that really scenic highway that that goes along the the, the Pennsylvania side there. Um, you can you can see that area, and it, it, it's it's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. That's one of my favorites, and you can make a case too for like zoological type thing that there's. It's very easy to make a case that there could be underground. Um, chambers of water that are passable from Lake Erie to, to um, the new Kinzu Reservoir, the Allegheny Reservoir. Um, it's not it's not a crazy uh, supposition that oh, yeah. there's chambers underneath that that would connect them. Um, and there is um, a very there's a lot of reports on Lake Erie um, of, a, of a serpent like um, thing. I think they call her Bessie. Um, and in, it's kind of a uh, serpent like it, uh, and maybe that's what Kinzu Nessie is. Um, and but it, it's 
you can see a connection bet between the two of them. Um, I, think, uh, I think they have an AH. I think they have an AHL team out there that's named after the the uh, Lake Erie, the monster Lake Erie, Lake Erie Monsters. I forget who their mm -hmm. I forget who their affiliate is, but mm -hmm. yeah, and and you know it's it's pretty easy to make the the connection between the two because Allegheny Reservoir is not very old, so it wouldn't be an ancient breeding repute or br breeding population there. You know, if it's there and it's where did it come from? Yeah maybe from the lake because you know allegheny reservoir it's just it was you know they dammed up uh dammed up the river it was you know a riverbed but it certainly couldn't support something uh of that size how deep how deep is the reservoir is it is it substantially deep or is it it's a it's a good sized reservoir i don't know exactly how deep it is um and uh but it is awfully deep and the really if you ever want to see something cool too is you, you look at some aerial video or photos from just above the dam, there's another reservoir that's above the dam and it's a, uh, it's a circular, it's a perfectly circular reservoir that's actually like a, a funnel and they use it, they fill it during high water and then during low water times they use it to, uh, to supply more electricity. And it's actually, that thing is super, super deep because it's way above the actual um, dam and Allegheny Reservoir. And it you can come up kind of close to it and it's fenced off and you can kind of see the see some of the water of it from the perspective, but it's got really high fences and um, signs that, that definitely um, the government is definitely doesn't want you in there um and lets you know that um and we've talked to people that have worked as contractors up there and they talk about the light from their equipment almost getting like sucked into like a like the like the effect of a black hole when it shines on there normally like light bounces off of water and stuff and they said it's the exact opposite effect it's like it sucks it and takes it down and it's it's a crazy little crazy feature of uh, of uh, of that that Kenzu uh, Dam and Allegheny Reservoir is that that reservoir that's up above it, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I got to look into that next time. Mm -hmm. I we uh, me and a buddy we were out working on uh, some skitter tires and um, up in the Allegheny National Forest, and we took kind of a little went off on a lark after we were done. And we kind of got lost and we're kind of around and we ended up at that, that reservoir and it was, uh, there was a creepy feeling there. And, um, it was actually, um, I think it was the first day of, of maybe the first government shutdown that we had a couple of years ago. And, um, it was, it was, we're like, let's get out of here. We were going to get out and check things out. And we got out and we walked maybe 20 feet from the truck and we're like, you know, maybe we'll go elsewhere and uh so we packed up and off we went <laughs> and uh but yeah yeah and so i want to sh i want to shift ge gears real real quickly um okay. and um uh, tom you've been kind of you, you've been kind of quiet quiet most of the night so i'll aim this question up at you you guys okay. just posted a um trail camera photo from uh that came out of spartansburg pennsylvania brendan if we could get that up donald slovey yeah, so um, it was a little, yeah, it was a little enhanced. It got lit up a little more, but um, mm -hmm. when you when it gets lit up, you can see what appears to be, a, I don't want to say like a right eye, something really, something really hairy. You know, maybe like a bit of a nose here. Um, what's the story behind? What's the story behind this photo? From what I gathered, it comes from a group called uh, DWS Bigfoot Researchers. I think I saw a comment saying that the uh trail camera it was taken from supposedly it gotten smashed so my question is um and you know in addition to hearing about the backstory what what are the qualities about this image that make you think this could actually in fact be like a bigfoot or something cryptic or paranormal in nature and that's not just uh you know whole mm -hmm. thing like that. the the important thing about donald Slo slovy stuff is that there's so much of it there. There, he has so many pictures. He has so many casts. Um, he's just 
he's an awesome Bigfoot guy if, if there ever was one. Um, he has uh, pictures of uh, the creature walking through the woods and all this kind of stuff, and he has the trail cam. I just I think that everything he has is legit. He has the uh, the uh, oh my god video on uh, YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that one, but I mean he's been he's been everywhere with he's been all over with and uh, I just I think that he just does a great job, man. I just mm -hmm. I do. He's a very sincere guy, um, and uh, we're very good friends with Donald and um, and you know. That that picture there, you know, he his wife actually, I believe, did the lightning up there for his ex wife, and um, yeah, it's it's I I believe every word Donald Slovey tells me. Um, he's just to me he's <laughs> he's dripping with um uh you know he's to me he, he's sincerity. Um, we did a feature on him. Um, and he's got maybe one of the most impressive uh, track collections or cast collections in America. Um, he's got about 200 to 250 uh, individual casts. Um, and uh, the, Oh my God video. Um, I think I've seen it in, in your group. It's there's uh, him and his wife and you only hear her. She keeps saying, Oh my God. Oh my God. And Bigfoot's kind of going back and forth, almost like pacing. Um, and, you know that's 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 a really cool video, and that's all. That's only about twenty miles from us here, and all of Donald's stuff stuff is done within a few few miles of, of his own home in Spartansburg. Um, and uh, he's you know, go ahead. One place I was going to go investigate this place, and I talked to Donald, and I said that uh, I was going to go there and this and that. And he said, yeah, you'll have some luck, but you better be careful because they're really aggressive there. And I was like, the guy even knows if the temperament of the Bigfoot is mild or, or you know, what it was. And I went out there and I had a, 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 a story that day. I heard what it sounded like uh, two deaf mutes in the woods arguing with each other. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I, I'm there in a snowstorm. And I'm listening to people that, like, there's no way they would have been in the middle of the game, Lance. And, uh, you know, I had to go back and I had to say, Donald, you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and for us, you know, Donald, I, I believe every word that Donald Slovey tells me. Um, and, yeah. and, and, to, and to tell you the truth, the guy's been doing it. A long time that that oh my god video is uh that's i think that's almost 20 years old and the guy has his his group and he puts his stuff out there a bit but man for having the quality of stuff i mean like that picture there you know for having the you know the quality of stuff that he has he ain't really out parading it around he's just some schmo that likes to go out in the woods and uh, do his thing with Bigfoot. And, uh, you know, he's not made a dime off of it, and he's not a very wealthy guy to be supporting this habit of his. He's got to spend – just his his plaster caster bill alone has got to be hellacious for him. Um, and uh, he, yeah. has a, he has casts in the Bigfoot Museum too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he's got. I mean, he does a fantastic job yeah. with his cast, where he gets, he gets very, very good details, and you'll see like the the ball of the foot. And in our our feature with him, he uh, we call him Master Caster. Um, he he talks about when he first makes his initial pour into a cast, he makes a very thin mixture, a very watery mixture, and he and he pours that into the cast. And then he pours, makes a second pour that's thicker that adds adds the uh, the bulk to it. But he's using that first very thin pour to to capture the the details. And 
he does a very, very nice job. Um, and he, he's opened up his collection to us and he just pulls them out and there's boxes everywhere and they're, they're fantastic. He's got some of his best ones. He's got, um, in these, these really nice cases with, you know, like velvet behind them and glass in front of them. Um, and, uh, I've actually been able to uh, speak at conferences with, with them and, uh, been able to help them display those. And, uh, Th those are those are really really cool um and that was one of the things about when we we did our feature with him we not looking to uh ask him to prove anything to us um and he really opened up to us about the techniques that he used like techniques for his pouring um the techniques he uses to try and lure them in with like uh different things like peanut butter and, and stuff like that um and he's he's to us he's the real deal and mm -hmm. that 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 picture there it's kind of odd to me it looks to me more like a wild man than a bigfoot yeah i got more yeah. of a caveman like a caveman -y vibe from it yeah and maybe that's from the enhancement but it, you know you look at that forehead and that's sure like a that, that looks like a bony forehead, you know, very pronounced, almost a uh, Cro-Magnon or maybe, you know, giants. And there, is, there is no one on this earth that is more sincere than Donald Slovey. Yeah. 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 100%. Yeah. And, and like that, Oh my God video, the, the woman that keeps saying it, it, that video has survived. If it was a hoax, it survived, a, um, it survived a divorce. And, and I guarantee you, if I if I had ever made a hoax and my ex wife knew about it, she would have told the world. <laughs> yeah. That's true, man. This is why yeah. I stay single. Hey, has he ever sent any of his casts out to like Meldrum or like Cliff for any of those guys to kind of look at him? Or yeah, he, I think that um, I think is it the Bigfoot Museum in Maine that has his. Cast no, it's uh, in Georgia. In Georgia. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that he has been in contact with I think Meldrum. Um, yes. And and you, you know and, and I think Meldrum. I think as far as I know, he was like, well, these look legit to me, um, because they're very good casts, very detailed casts. And um, I mean, like, on some of them, you, you see like the role of the 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 ball of the foot and and uh and the heel you know um and uh really really good stuff really good yeah. stuff you know and really what you got to do you got to get cryptovania you got to get roku you got to get on there and you got to see what uh he's talking about with donald Slovy the master caster because the whole program is on there and it's right there it's right mm -hmm. in front of you. on Hulu, right What's that? Are you, are you, aren't you guys on Hulu or you have like a plug it on Hulu or something like that? I no. don't No, no. No, just Roku. on the just on the Roku. Okay. Yeah, and it's our own channel Cryptovania. Um and uh yeah, yeah. But and he really opens up to us and we even uh, got to interview his boy um who's uh uh who is, has seen Bigfoot himself. My boy interviewed uh Donald's boy for that and uh and it, it, it's kind of cool. It's it's really cool, um, you know. And I think the most difficult point point of that uh, that video was Donald's such a soft spoken guy, um, and that you know picking him up on the on the microphone, you know, it, that was a little bit of a challenge. I had to work with that um, because he's a very soft spoken guy, um, and uh, yeah. But he was he's good guy right there. Yeah, good guy. Good guy. Mm -hmm. it, and again, that's 20 miles from us right there. Yeah. Um, See, you know, so this, this is what you, you guys are missing out on all this. You guys ought to be coming to Cryptovania yeah. more often. Even even his, his mom has a, a, a great, Donald Slovey's mom has a great, a great uh, encounter uh, that, that she, she will tell you. Um, and, uh, you know, she, and it's right in Spartansburg, PA. Their house is not deep, deep in the woods at all. It's, yeah. um, it's a couple, it's like a few houses back behind the dollar general. And, 
is she saw one right right down the yard and uh you know right across there and uh good good people right there yep yeah it's interesting you mentioned that too because i i really thought to, to have the best chance of seeing one of these things you have to go like as far away from people as possible out out in the middle of nowhere well i think that's the case i'm kind of thinking if this is, you know, like if this is like a living, living, breathing thing, maybe we really shouldn't discount woods that border, you know, pr private property or residential areas. Because if you think about it, those woods, especially if it's not attached to like public land or anything like that, or like you know, like trails or anything like that, how often, are, how often are people going through there? There's probably way less people. There's probably way More less than people than that go through stretches of woods like that than there are on public land so you know at the very uh, least i'll tell you what here's here's something you don't want to forget about the best place to go where there's woods at is behind schools because mm -hmm. behind schools it's always secluded there is so much stuff that goes on in, inside those woods mm -hmm. and, and, and i have i have a woods that there's a school on one side and there's a cemetery on the other man that is that place is great yeah, and it's not very wild at all. Yeah. yeah, one, one, yeah. Of, one of the witnesses, Mike and I have been working with, she said the same thing, that they they hang out behind in the high school. Yep. And, yeah. Yeah, because yep. of the dumpsters. I mean, the high school is kind of close to the Appalachian Trail, so that could be yep. another thing. But she definitely yeah. said the schools is definitely a – plus, they still, she said that they watch the kids during the day. It's almost like mm – -hmm. That's right. That's one of my big theories is that we're the bait. And the farther you go deep into the woods, the the farther I think you're getting from the bait, you know. And I, I think they're just as curious about us as we are about them, or at least there's something making them want to have encounters with us. Um, I don't think I really don't believe that Bigfoot is making that much effort to escape us. You know, I kind of feel like we're kind of the bait and they're, they're purposely, they're purposely mixing with us. Um, you know, or inter interacting with us, I believe. Um, and, and I think that if you go deep, deep, deep into the Allegheny national forest here, you might see some wild things, but I think you walked right past Bigfoot on your way. Yep. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you know, we got, uh, we got those weird ass owls, howls last time, last time we were there and we only explored like a fraction Mm -hmm. action of the area um the whole the whole school theory the whole school things kind of it's interesting too when you think about it because those buildings are only in use during the day you know when these you know like when like you know, squatches are supposed to be um asleep or back in you know in their dens or whatever during the winter you know during the day when they're still on the ground kids aren't going out for like gym or recess or anything like that during the summer during the summer, that's two straight months when there's, you know, when there's nothing going on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be, there might be something to it. Um, and again, it kind of ties right back to what, you know, a lot of the, uh, the missing person reports where kids are, are found again and protected by a benevolent creature of some sort, you know, um, that's, you know, there, there's a similarity there. You know, um, maybe they have a soft spot for kids and, uh, you know, that's, you know, purely benevolent and, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, an interesting thing there. Yeah. And it does seem that the school doesn't have to be very, uh, very deep in the woods for it to be a, a, a hot spot for uh, reported activity. And, you know, it's like with all mammals, Everybody loves like the cute bunny or the cute little deer. Everything loves little stuff. Yeah, and that's a way, I think Bigfoot's the same way. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, look at us. We're we're what, not near as cute as our kids. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, or maybe not near as entertaining to Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Well, the same line. So I think also corporate parks too, you know, for mm -hmm. the same reasons. Like on the weekends, there's no one there. They have yep. dumpsters. A lot of them are being put in like areas where that were were wooded at one time, and now there's a big huge parking lot and a building or whatever. So 
I think you know, you, you know, people should maybe look at uh, corporate parks as well. You know, on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yep. If, if there's anything. We have, a, we have a friend whose uh, hot spot is a a corporate uh, a corporate park that uh, processes uh, bacon, and uh, he says it's it's you know, it's kind of a tucked out and kind of an out of the way place, and he said it's one really heck of a good uh, one heck of a good hot spot. Um, I can and, see, I can uh, see that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, too, with more people working from home, like where I live, I, um, my job's out in a corporate park. We're located in a corporate park out in uh, southern Connecticut. And we're pretty much the only company that still uses that build so that, you know, still uses, um, you know, that building mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah, I was telling Mike the other day, last week, I was, I was working in a corporate park and I was walking out to the company vehicle. And I swear, a 250 pound bear ran right those park. Like 15 feet, we ran right by me. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's definitely you know, when you encroach on their territory, you know, you're not there on the weekends. I definitely think that there's some uh, possibility of potential. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever heard of circling back to some ancient peoples? Have you guys ever heard of the uh, the large pyramid that was um, in found in Ohio? And shortly after it was found, they the uh, Army Corps of Engineers dismantled it to use the uh, the the uh, the stone to build a dam. It's here in uh, it's in Western Ohio, and it's uh, it's known as the 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 northernmost uh, supposedly Aztec pyramid, um, and uh, or is there maybe some in Michigan? I can't remember that, but it's awfully far up here. But it was it was documented and. It's a very large pyramid, and they just happened to decide that it, the the year after it was reported in the newspapers to dismantle almost the entire thing and use it use those stones to help build a dam. Um, you know, we we talk about you know the the Smithsonian and such, you know, coming in and and, and taking evidence. You know, what what kind of wonderful things could they have possibly unearthed when they were. Uh, they made that decision to uh, dismantle that entire pyramid, um, you know, for the uh, the all important purpose of building a reservoir. Um, and you know, there's still remnants of it. I think you can still see like like the one of the couple of the corners and stuff, but most of the interior is, is gone. You know, um, and that kind of what what that kind of points to like what we were talking about, like maybe the, you know. You know, these were ancient people here and ancient civilizations that uh, we just don't know very much about at all. Um, and, uh, you know, where else is things like that exist that have just been kind of memory hold? Um, and how many it doesn't take a lot of generations for something like that to completely disappear forever. That's um, right. You know, we one of the things that we're going to do this summer is we have a buddy that uh is a, a musician down in Florida that has spent time up here and his family used to have a camp over in Waterboro, New York and Waterboro is a hamlet that really doesn't exist anymore. It was, uh, it was wiped out by a um, scarlet fever uh, epidemic in the, uh, I think like the 1820s or thirties. And it, that it, it happened right there in the winter time. And Back then, when you had these houses and they had the the dirt base floor basements and all those people dying of scarlet fever in the wintertime, where do you bury them? So they are buried down in the basements. And the couple of houses that are left, when you go down into the dirt basements, you can see where the ground is sunk down from what had happened is his family members died. They buried him in the basement with the intention of unearthing him and reburying him in the spring when the ground thawed. And this buddy of ours is what they had a family camp at the time. And he wants to come up and, uh, and, and do some stuff up there at, at Waterboro. And when I was going to do research about it, there's so little that is out there about that. It's almost like it never existed. And you wonder how long it's going to be before it really disappears and never existed, you know, to where you can't find any evidence about it. 
Um, and you wonder if that's happened with uh, a lot of the uh, ancient civilizations and such. You know, it doesn't take very long to memory hole something. You know, we see in, you know, like uh, in in modern day stuff, like the, the Sinbad movie that may or may not exist, you know, things are kind of weird with, uh, you know. The butterfly effect. Yeah, yeah. And, and especially back in before modern times, you know, all of the narratives were basically controlled by very small groups of people. And for us to believe that history is as we've been taught, you have to believe that those very small group of people were always had good intentions. They, yeah. You know, and that kind of sounds like a conspiracy theory to me. <laughs> the show keeps on giving. We're going to hit every yeah. topic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, it looks like we're it looks like we're running out of time, unfortunately. Before we wrap up, uh, you want to just tell everyone where they could find you guys? No, right. you want me to take that time? Yes, that'll be good. Yeah, that's kind of my spiel. Um, you can find us on Roku if you search for uh, uh, Cryptovania. It comes up usually at C R Y P. It'll come up as a suggestion. Um, and any Roku uh, enabled device and most. Most uh, televisions sold today are Roku enabled, um, and it runs off your Wi-Fi. We have, I, at, at, I don't think we've hit 700 selections yet, but we we will soon on that channel. Um, we have our own stuff, and we have uh, our peer generated archives of uh, other producers' stuff, um, including like Tony Merkel's and the Confessionals. We have a uh, Wes Germer and Sasquatch Chronicles. Um, we're very proud to be the only uh, the place where you can find Jonathan Lackey's um, Pennsylvania Scanicum research. Um, you can't find that anywhere else in the world now, but uh, on Cryptovania. Um, and then we have our own stuff on there. And then we also have our very robust uh, Facebook group. And we have a, our Cryptovania TV page, which is basically for the channel. And we have our physical location of Cryptovania, which is right here in northwest Pennsylvania, the area emanating around Titusville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Cryptovania HQ is in Hydetown. Um, we're about 45 minutes south of Erie, Pennsylvania. And we really embrace our geographic location, too. We, we love it here. And uh, we want to share. Uh, we want to share our riches because we we feel we have a, a wealth of uh, of uh, good stories waiting to be told here. Yeah, we're definitely. You know, there, there's no way I could remember all that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're definitely we're definitely going to try to make make it out to you. Make it out to you guys. You know, um, I love how we've you know really keep in touch with you guys. Yeah. Since, yeah. Uh, came yeah. On, since you came on the show first, you know, like um, a first time. Literally every time I speak to you guys, it just makes me want to get back out there. <laughs> yep, awesome. so we'll are you guys going to the uh, Sasquatch okay. Triangle this year? Yes, yes, we are going to go there. Yep, I'm going to make a point to get out there. To, cool. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, we really like that. Uh, we we feel that our like our our second home is that uh, Western Ohio there, um, especially the folks up around Coshocton. Um, that's yeah. that's that's kind of a second home for us. It, in Corky Marple too, man. There's a lot of good people over there. Yes. Yeah, Amy Boos from uh, over in Ohio too. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's our second home. All okay. right. Well, um, I definitely want to. Well, uh, Jason, Tommy, I definitely want to thank you guys again for taking the time to come on. You guys are, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. You know, we could definitely go all night. We could definitely go all night. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe we'll maybe we'll still set it up someday. Um, definitely yeah. want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, make sure to tune in next week when uh, Gwen and Carrie make their debut. From behind tall trees, ladies' night, they'll be having ECBRO founder Daniel Benoit on. Nice, nice. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. After that, Brendan's going to finish out the month of March. He's going to have uh, MK Davis back on, and then me and Chuck are back in April. We'll have uh, Melissa Adair and Phil Poling on. So we definitely have a solid lineup coming up for everyone coming up next yeah. couple of weeks. So we um, absolutely love MK Davis. Cool. Yeah, he's yeah. always he's a character. He's always a riot. Yeah, well, um, guys. Again, uh, you know, thank you know, uh, thank you so much for coming on again. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, definitely appreciate the support you guys have uh, given us. You know, a huge fan of the Cryptovania channel. So Absolutely. definitely looking forward to working with you guys in the future. So um, yeah, stick around. Before, 
do this uh, thing. Right, don't, man. don't just yeah, don't just leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's all. That's all we got for tonight. Uh, thanks again. Until next time, um, you can play us out, Brendan. You've been watching From Behind Tall Trees, a Catskill Appalachian Research Collective production. For more information on this program and others like it, remember to like, share, and subscribe to CARC Universal Today to join the conversation on our Facebook group and become a member of the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective Facebook group. CARC. We